Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis, and I want to let you know that later on tonight I'm going to be releasing the next episode of the second season of Alien Invasion. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later in the video, but first I want to talk about something even more important, which is real life. I've been into prepping and preparedness for a while now, and there's always been a couple of, uh, you know, kind of key topics, key uh, dangers, challenges that I've had on my radar is kind of the most likely things I was likely to see during my lifetime. Uh, you know, one of those obviously is aliens invading by air dropping bird flu infected clown zombies. That's a given. We all know that that's, you know, just around the corner. Uh, but, you know, the other two big ones were environmental and economic collapse. And it looks like we might be looking down the barrel of both of those guns simultaneously at the moment. So let's talk a little bit about that. You know, obviously, uh, the fallout from the reaction to COVID, you know, governments around the world trying to uh, slow the spread of that has had a real economic impact on the entire planet. And even prior to that, you know, we've been kicking the economic can down the road for a while, you know, uh, you know, here in the United States, racking up debt, racking up debt, racking up debt. Uh, you know, so to some degree, I think a lot of this is going to get blamed on COVID, but it was stuff that was baked into the cake even prior to it. It it's looking like we might be reaching our limit of how many more times we can kick that can down the road. Here in the United States, we, at least at the moment, have the reserve currency for the world, so the powers of B have been able to, you know, kind of keep pushing that stuff further and further into the future. You know, we could, you know, be printing money, essentially, literally. Um, well, not literally, because now we do it digitally. But, uh, you know, we could be printing money to make it seem as though the problems that we were facing weren't actually there, so that we could, you know, keep things calm, keep things peaceful. You know, there's a, a limit to how long that kind of thing can go on, and, you know, it's looking like we might be getting to the end of that, especially with the competition between different world powers. But even more... Uh, even larger than that, and also, uh, you know, this is kind of something that's driving the, some of the economic issues, is the environmental issues. Now, I know that's controversial. Some people want to believe that stuff doesn't exist. I don't honestly care. It doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not in, in terms of whether it's happening. You know, I mean, there are crop losses here, crop losses there, too much rain here, too much rain there, all these sorts of, uh, you know, uh, weather-related disasters all over the place. And, you know, the world can only take so much of that. We saw how thin-skinned a lot of our systems were with COVID, with just tiny little things, uh, you know, screwing up the whole system. Or the Suez Canal, uh, you know, one boat locks up uh, international trade all over the world. The way our system has been set up, it's cheap, it's fast, but it's not that resilient. And little things you know, you can only hold off so many of those given the way that our system is set up. And at the moment, there are massive crop losses all over the world. Here in the United States, most of the places where we grow food are not getting enough rain. And uh, the powers that be, in the same way that they uh, have been kind of kicking the can down the road uh, economically, they can do that to some degree. Environmentally, there are, there are reserves, there are ways of kind of sourcing things from different parts of the world, but those, even those kind of methods are starting to have uh, negative impacts uh, that, you know, can only go so far. By the United States kind of grabbing up food from other parts of the world, that drives up the price all over the place in places that are poor, that don't have the financial resources of the United States. That's starting to have a real negative impact on the people there because while the United States is gobbling this food up, other places are losing access to it. And just because those problems are uh, in places that aren't the United States, and I know there is, there is poverty and there, is, uh, uh, there are food access issues here in the United States, but they're not the same as they are in, in uh, other parts of the world that, are, you know, that don't have things as fortunate as they are here. But ju just because we see those things in other places doesn't mean those things can't come here too. And I know a lot of people, they, they see things through a self-interest lens, and the only reason that they're going to think something's a problem is if it's going to impact them personally. I don't see the world that way. If somebody somewhere else is starving, I see that as a problem, uh, you know, not as intimately as if I am personally starving, but, you know, starvation anywhere is bad. But it's even more horrible for you if it's happening to you. And... A lot of these problems might be coming to our shores. Uh, you know, grocery stores are going to be sourcing more and more product from overseas because of crop fa failures here in the United States. We're going to be grabbing things from other countries, and that makes our system even more fragile and less resilient. Again, with the Suez Canal getting blocked up uh, and, and shipping, uh, you know, almost grinding to a halt, uh, halt for, you know, quite a while, uh, you know, we are going to be more and more 
impacted by those kinds of problems if your, your food is coming from around the planet instead of, you know, down the street. So these are things that we really need to look at. At the very least, I think it's prudent to presume that there are going to be higher food prices at the grocery store and the quality of the food that you're seeing is not going to be quite as high because with less available uh, supply, there's less ability to say, ah, you know, this one's not good enough. We'll throw that in the dumpster and, you know, we'll sell this one. If, you know, supplies are short, everything's going to be like, okay, good enough, it's food, let's get it out there. So I think the quality is going to be going down and the prices are going to be going up. So what can you do about that? You don't want to just complain about it. What can you actually do about that kind of thing? Well, right now, I know prices are higher now than they were two years ago, but right now I think the prices of food are lower than they're going to be a year from now or two years from now. So if you are interested in setting up a pantry, start doing that kind of stuff now. Buy non-perishable food. I'm not going to tell you what to buy. I've made so many videos on it. You can look at my video catalog. There are other channels all over YouTube that have recommendations about that. Go out there. Uh, you know, Google, how do I start my own pantry? There's plenty of information out there. But start doing it because uh, it is, it's really important to uh, pad yourself from these sorts of situations because uh, you know, you've seen the way people react when they can't even get something like toilet paper. Can you imagine what people are going to be like? Are you going to want to go to the store when it's not a toilet paper shortage, it is a, a flour shortage, a cooking oil shortage, a food shortage? Can you imagine how much worse things are going to be and do you want to be out in that or do you want to just be able to walk into your pantry and get whatever you would stockpiled earlier? Uh, it just, it just makes so much sense to do that. I know that, uh, you know, before COVID, people never could have imagined the changes that happened during COVID. Uh, and, and, and at this point, people almost take it for granted. I've talked to people that were never into prepping and preparedness. And I talked, I'm talking to them about, you know, what's coming next. And, and they're saying, well, I can't see us that happening. And I remind them about my conversations with them pre-COVID when I talked about the idea that there could be lockdowns and there could be, uh, you know, uh, shortages of availability of things. Uh, you know, when I was building my house, as soon as I knew that COVID uh, was going to be a thing, uh, which was like right at the very beginning, everything that was going to be coming from China, I was specifically looking at China because that's where it started, anything that was coming from China, I pre-ordered to make sure that it wouldn't slow me down in building my house. I took it very seriously and I spread that uh, the thinking to other people, and it was generally really rejected. People just could not comprehend that things could change so quickly and so dramatically. The same thing could happen right now with food. Think about the way you felt before COVID and how you, you know, you got used to all these crazy things that happened with COVID. If we start seeing food shortages, you're going to be in the same position next year related to food where you're going to be thinking about like, you know, oh, the way things were when you could just go to the grocery store and you can get things and it wasn't uh, you know, your entire paycheck just to, you know, get a loaf of bread or whatever. Uh, things can change really quickly and I think people really forget about that. So take it seriously now, get some, uh, some food prepped in your pantry, you know, some staples, things you can't grow. Think about growing a garden. Even if you, you know, a lot of people think about like, well, I'm either going to like be the, you know, your average, uh, you know, yokel that just goes to the grocery store and they gets all their food from the grocery store, or I'm going to be a homesteading farmer and I source 100% of my food from my land. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, if food prices go up 10% or 30%, but you, are, you start growing 10% or even 30% of your food, you're counteracting those kind of price uh, changes. So it makes it for you that your grocery bill is kind of the same because you're paying more for certain things, but you're getting some stuff kind of for free because you grew it yourself. And if you don't feel like you have uh, the knack for being a gardener, shame on you, you should have more confidence in yourself. But if, uh, you know, if you don't want to mess with that yet, you don't even really have to because in the wild world, there are just so many things that are just jumping out wanting to be eaten by you. Uh, here in the United States, we throw away about 40% of uh, the food that we grow goes into the dumpster, whether it's, uh, you know, before it gets to the market or spoilage on the way to the market, or, you know, people just don't eat all their food and they throw it away. But almost half of the food that's created here in the United States gets thrown away. And that's a shame. That's a real shame that that happens. But I would say that the number is actually even higher than that if you count all the food that's growing around us. Right here next to me, this is Queen Anne slice. It's also known as a parsnip or a wild carrot. You can eat the root on this plant, uh, you know, just like you might a carrot. This plant is a little bit sketchy. I wouldn't recommend jumping right into these types of plants because in this same family of plant, uh, there are plants that look very similar to this, known as uh, poison hemlock and water hemlock, which is the most poisonous plant in North America. So maybe you don't want to start here, but there are lots of plants that are really easy and really safe. Right next to me on the other side 
is this evening primrose. Uh, this is a plant where quite a few parts of the plant are completely edible, including these little they're kind of like fruits, and I use the term fruit loosely. I mean, well, I use it in a scientific sense because uh, there's, there's seeds in these little casings here. But you can eat these. They don't taste great. You know, we could saute that up in a stir fry or something like that. We have food growing all around this. And if you count in all this kind of stuff, we probably eat 1% of the food that we have access to in our world here in the United States anyway. Yeah, it doesn't taste that great. <laughs> it's not my favorite. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you get into wild plant foraging, there are, it's just so easy to just go out, you know, whether it's at a park or, you know, your own backyard. Now, I wouldn't go to a park uh, and start foraging right where people, like, let their dogs pee. And I wouldn't, uh, you know, forage from my backyard if you've got, like, an old junker car that's dripping oil and you're like, oh, wow, this wild edible whatever growing out from underneath my dripping, like, oil leaking car, you know. you got to have your standards. Uh, but there is a lot of availability there. And all you have to do is just grab yourself a book and start with the easy stuff. You know, evening primrose is easy. There's pl uh, plants called plantains, not the banana type, but there's like a leafy plant called plantains. Dandelions are easy. Lamb's quarters is easy. Uh, there's all sorts of things that are really easy. Uh, here, here's, a, here's what I'm just going to throw out. If you're in North America and you see something that looks like a raspberry, it may not be a raspberry, but it's not poisonous. Anything here that grows wild in North America that looks like a raspberry, at the very least, is not poisonous. So there's your start right there. If you're out in the woods and you see some raspberry-like looking berry, I mean, as long as the leaves look like a raspberry plant and the, the berries look like a raspberry. It may not be a raspberry, it could be a blackberry or a mulberry or this or that or the other thing, but it's not poisonous and there are a lot of plants like that. So you can start augmenting your food sources that way. Okay, so you know, if you don't have a fire under your ass, get a fire under your ass. This, this uh, fall, this winter, I think is going to be rough. But let's talk about fiction. We've got Alien Invasion. Uh, I don't know what number episode this is coming out, uh, but it is the next in the series of, uh, you know, the second season. Uh, I wanted to uh, let you guys know it's going to be released at 8.30 tonight. Uh, this video has been so long, if, if we already gone past 8.30 at this point. Um, it's going to be released at 8.30 tonight. I still would love to get you guys two episodes per month, but we're just... Uh, you know, just the budget's not there for it. I, they, each episode takes, you know, somewhere upwards of 20 or more hours per uh, to put it together. There's enough funding, you know, to leg legitimize me putting in, you know, 20 hours per month on uh, bringing these things to you guys. I'd love to get that up. There's a couple ways you guys can do that. One way is just go to patreon.com slash praxis prepper below. Uh, that helps, you know, even for like a dollar a month, you can help uh, keep the channel going. Also, if you are a member at any level, you get your name in the end credits of every episode that gets released while you're a member. And also, you get instant access to all the videos, uh, not when they get released on YouTube, but as soon as they're done. And as soon as I finish editing them, they get released over on uh, Patreon. So there's a lot more episodes available there that you can watch instantly. Uh, than the ones that are coming out once a month on YouTube. Another way that you could help me uh, get to a point where we're at two uh, episodes per month, and I've mentioned this a couple times before, and I want to thank everyone that's helped so far on it, is I have another channel. It's a kid's channel. I'm trying to get it monetized. YouTube has uh, set uh, the goalpost that I need to have 1,000 subscribers, or I need to have 4,000 watch hours, and I'm so close to both of those goalposts at the moment. I just need about 300 more subscribers and uh, about 200 more watch hours. So if you have the means, here's a link to that channel. If you can subscribe to that channel and play one of my half hour videos, I think we would get there. And as soon as we get there, I'll just release another episode of Alien Invasion because um, you, know, you guys help me and that means a lot. And if I can get some revenue off that other channel, for which I've already made 12,000 videos, and I haven't seen a penny of it because YouTube's playing ads, but they don't give me any of the revenue. Uh, if you guys can help me sharing some of the revenue of my own videos, uh, you know, I will be able to, uh, you know, thank you guys by releasing more Alien Invasion episodes. So I hope you enjoy tonight's episode, and again, if you do not feel a fire under your ass about getting ready for food and economic issues coming up, you know, set food aside, Set money aside. You know, I, I know people are always tight on budgets, but no matter how little money you make, there's somebody living near you that might have more kids than you and all the other things who's living on less. And they're, you know, if they can make it work and they're living on a smaller paycheck than you're getting, you can take some of that extra money that you have and, you know, you can set some of it aside because, you know, um, going without whatever you might be going without now, whether it's like, you know, as many minutes on your phone or as much data on your phone or, uh, you know, the nicer versions of the food that you buy is going to pale com to comp in comparison to like a year from now if you're really low on money and at that point you're just like, I just wish I could get some food. I just wish I could buy 
something to eat for my family. So, uh, you know, kind of compare uh, what you're giving up now to what you might be giving up by not giving that up and uh, try to take that motivation. Save up some money, set aside some food, and, you know, put yourself in a good position for this fall because remember that, that difference between pre-COVID and, and post-COVID. The world can twist really quickly and don't let it catch you by surprise. That's it. Thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.